Hello and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga. This is episode number 638. This is 638 of the Agostino Zynga Show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga. I hope you are doing well wherever this lovely, lovely podcast may be finding you. How am I? All good, all things considered. Um, I'm struggling a tad at the moment with the whole news resolution thing. I think like many people out there, I've said plenty of times this pod before, I'm a far different person than I was, you know, post-pandemic than pre-pandemic. I think pre-pandemic, I was sort of autopilot, but I did have my routine structures and ways of kind of going about life that were quite ingrained and were pretty much solidified. But I think post-pandemic, I've kind of come out of it and I've developed a real lazy, lazy mindset that I'd never had before. And I think a lot of it comes down to this word I keep hearing in my head whenever I'm about to do something that's going to be enriching or empowering to my life. What's the point? Or a phrase. What's the point? I keep hearing that in my head. And I think that is definitely one of those things that you hear in your head if you're somebody that doesn't have any drive or you've just kind of given up. And I never had that voice ever say something like my head ever before maybe it's a age thing who knows well you know older you get the more you start to sort of maybe recline no I wouldn't say you sort of maybe sort of start reclining in your chair you start to take your foot off the pedal you're not super eager or angsty to prove yourself all the time um or to prove yourself to yourself you're not trying to prove others wrong or correct or whatever it may be um you're not trying to keep up with the joneses you maybe have accepted the natural course of how your life's gonna go but i'm not that kind of guy i'm still that dude who thinks i can dictate every single part of my life with the actions i make and you know it might be a bit naive to think that way it might be a bit um, empty-headed full-hearted whatever it may be but call me those names tattoo them on me stamp them on my forehead mark me like a flipping cow i'll go and believe those things because that's what's keeping me alive these days because why, why else would i want to stay in this godforsaken planet if i don't have any sort of dreams of trying to pursue or chase things a little bit lofty and a little bit out there but motivation has been there it's just the drive to get it done has been a bit absent and again like i said i think it's a pre no sorry post pandemic sort of malaise i just haven't been able to shake it and i think that maybe goes to speak to the general approach i'm having with life i think even with raven and just you know other cultural bits and bits bots i do in terms of hobbies and whatnot they've all kind of gone by the wayside mainly because of that kind of like meh what's the point sort of thing it's sort of like bordering on nihilism but it's not really it's kind of black pill but it's not really but it is a bit weird and i'm slowly but surely get into grips with that's what's going on and then trying to address it because one thing you shouldn't do is sort of pretend it's not happening and hope it just like you know it goes away and it kind of rectifies itself over time which it obviously won't so one step at a time hopefully that gets me where i need to go but for anyone out there struggling best believe someone like myself who i would describe myself as really self-motivated um really driven um you know um i work stuff out i don't need handouts i don't ask for help I don't actually care about people for the most part outside of myself, which is pretty scary. I am quite, you know, selfish in that regard. But if I'm having issues, just imagine what the regular, regular person out there is having. Do you know what I mean? Just imagine, just, just, just imagine what's going on out there. So, you know, whatever, what can you do? Talking about that sort of stuff, I'm thinking to myself, like, I've been hearing people say things about ins and outs um, for lists of the year in terms of like what's in and what's out for you. And I think one of the things that's like out for me, for sure, and should probably never have been in for you. I'm not too sure if you use guys kind of keep attention to this sort of stuff. But for me personally, I never, and I repeat, I've never ever cared or ever checked who follows me or who unfollows me. I don't know. For the most part, especially when it comes to Instagram, I kind of adopt the sort of like Virgil Abloh method of things. If I speak to you on the DMs or you seem cool, I'll just follow back. I don't necessarily care, care too tough about, you know, withholding my follow like as if I'm some big dog or something like that. I don't care because if Virgil could follow a million people like he was following, he even followed my lame ass, then of course I can follow you back. So I don't necessarily care about that sort of stuff. I'm not really precious about that kind of thing. But I hear a lot of conversations, especially around social media, um, especially around culture especially around you know different little you know sub um sub genres you know whatever subcultures that exist out there of people using the fact that somebody unfollowed them as a sign of their relationship deteriorating or, or deteriorating right They're like oh we're not friends anymore um we can't be cool anymore because you unfollowed me 
I guess if your friendship is based on social media, it would probably go a long way to illustrate how far you've fallen down in terms of your relationship with that person based on them unfollowing you. Um, fair enough. But if you actually want to be friends with people, because I'd imagine maybe I'm maybe I'm the one that's naive here, but I'd imagine if you're friends with somebody on social media, it would be safe to assume that you like them as a person and to like them as a person you have to understand that they exist in the real world if they exist in the real world it wouldn't it shouldn't really matter if they unfollowed you because you follow them so you still have an opportunity to kind of keep in touch with them and you can find you know out what's going on with them whenever you bump into them in real life or if ever you have the chance to meet them in real life that's where i kind of take it from there but just from a purely basic hipster um contrarian and just my own ass point of view i can never ever let anybody know that i care that much to check who's following and who unfollows me i don't care i've never have i never will like that's it i've never checked who's my follow who's on my followers i don't know who's there i don't know who's like i just don't care i've never cared and i feel like for you to um reduce yourself to caring who follows about you you're really doing yourself a disservice especially if you're an immigrant you're doing your ancestors a, a disservice by really making that the bane of your existence oh my god this person unfollowed me we're no longer friends it's like grow up it's not that big of a deal nobody cares and if anything, if you do want to get into that kind of slinging match in general, I just don't think it's going to lead to a um, happy ending. Because from what I've seen online, most people do hold their friend requests or friend follow or follows or how they, whatever, whatever that term is called. They hold, you know, they hold that hostage or they hold it on some pedestal. That's where they place that sort of stuff. It means a lot to them. So if that's the case, you're going to have to really bust your back you're going to really have to kind of spread it wide open to get on their list in the first place. And I don't know about you, but I'm not spreading it wide open for nobody. I don't care. You don't care who you are. I've never cared about that sort of stuff in terms of status and position. And again, it's maybe cost me some opportunities because I don't necessarily kiss or bow the ring. I'm not going to, you know, uh, I'm not going to, what's your friend called? I'm not going to pay my dues or that kind of weird code talk for getting on your knees and giving someone fellatio. I'm not doing that in the slightest. So the thing that I do as a protest to that is just not care and focus on the work, focus on living, focus on family and friends and all the stuff that actually matters in the long term of it. Because I can't ever imagine a future or a present in my life where I'll sit there caring and crying about somebody unfollowing me. I don't care. They followed me one time, they unfollow me next time. Who cares? I don't even want to try and entertain the ideas of why they did it. It could be for any number of reasons. Whatever you do it, do it for whatever reason you want to do it for. Enjoy yourself. But in 2023, please stop caring about who followed you and who unfollows you. Live your life. Share your content. Share your thoughts. Um, upload many stories. Like some people will unfollow you because you upload too many stories or because your posts are too spammy. Whatever it may be, do live your best life. It's your platform, isn't it? Why do you care what, what they... Do you know what I mean? Why should the way they interact with your platform or your page story dictate how you you know how you basically put it together just live your life it's not that big of a deal really life is life is really short sitting there worrying about how you know i know some people have a mental note of how many numbers you know their total numbers of followers and they kind of clock it and track it all the time and see what's tight you're doing too much you're doing too too much 2023 stop caring about who follows you and unfollows you on social media and just post actually no that should be the good one just post just post, focus on the post on the content and you'll live a far more productive life going forward i guarantee you a far more productive life talking about social media interesting post here courtesy of the shade room that features the one the only lizzo and she made a point here that i've currently trying to be in, i've kind of been saying a little bit which is maybe another second in and out right on out this year 2023 sorry will be to just stop believing people <laughs> and i think i didn't necessarily clarify that properly beforehand what i meant by stop believing people is that i think people in general maybe it's just me getting older and realizing this thing but people lie a lot like there's a lot of liars out there that just lie about their lives about their achievements about their accomplishments um about their awards about their financial status about their relationships about their friendships people just lie they lie all the time and sometimes they lie about the most mundane easily provable um you know easily sorry disprovable facts which is really concerning especially somebody who has devoted their whole entire life to creating content online who just lie about a story 
and then you'll rewind and say, no, but here's what you said about the story two years ago. So what is the truth? And then they'll just, and then they'll, then they'll act as if you're the one that's doing too much by, by pulling up the tape on them from two years ago. Crazy place we live in, but it is what it is. So the fact that people lie so often, I'm generally always going to go into things, you know, just, just kind of with the point of view of like, in the early days of maybe, me watching stuff to do with public freakouts on subreddits where people would be recording people arguing online. I remember one thing I took away from it after watching a lot of those clips of people arguing with somebody in a Walmart, somebody trying to run away with some expensive designer clothing and getting tackled by a security guard, you know, two women hurling racial abuse at each other, whatever it may be, just these crazy videos of just humans outside just, you know, wanting to tear each other limb from limb. One thing I realized that was quite common was that there was always this um, perspective of somebody that was filming the video from their smartphone and then kind of like goading the person on the, on the on the receiving end to respond or to say something like, oh, say that thing you said to me again. What do you say to me? What do you call me? That kind of thing, right? And I've realized across, like, oh, this is a narrative thing. They could try to control the narrative because what you don't see is what that person said. All you see is them kind of goading the person to saying some sort of racial slur, but you don't get, the bit that leads up to that section so clearly they've tried to frame it in a way of like oh this person just came up to me randomly whilst i was putting back my flipping basket or trolley and it just called me a flipping racial slur when clearly you know there's more to the story than meets the eye and i feel like a lot of the stories a lot of the you know um accusations and a lot of the just the things people say out there on the internet there's more to it than meets the eye so you have to kind of approach it thinking you know what i'm just not gonna i'm just not gonna believe people just based on what they say because they say it because people will be talking a whole lot of mess and it kind of leans a little bit to counterculture with what lizzo is saying here lizzo's kind of framed it in a very woke kind of like you know strange way because none of this really makes any sense but if i'm passing through it i kind of get where she's going from so this is a screenshot take it from the shade room of Lizzo's Twitter where she says the following this may be a random time to say this but it's on my heart cancel culture is appropriation there was real outrage from truly marginalized people and now it's become trendy misused and misdirected I hope we can phase this out or phase out this um focus on our outrage on the real problems so basically you know she's her saying the end of cancel culture please the end of cancel culture I've said from the beginning, I've always thought cancel culture was less about, well, what I had assumed it was in the beginning was more so a way to kind of have some level of like social justice. Now, if you couldn't get justice in the courts, um, if you couldn't get justice with the police, then you'd have to get justice in a social level by kind of embarrassing your accuser, right? Or embarrassing the perpetrator of whatever crime or whatever inconvenience or whatever argument or whatever disagreement, whatever you had during that time, right? That's what basically it would come down to. And it was kind of sad to see, right? People legitimately had horrible cases of like SA and R word and whatnot. And all they had was the ability to shame the person that did it to them in public and kind of let it be known. And then hope maybe the powers that be in the industry that they work in would distance themselves or should then lead that person to be in the financial ruin, blah, blah, blah. But it's not exactly like them going to prison. Because imagine if you were a victim of SA and R word, you'd want them to get everything. You want them to get prison time, stripped of assets, divorce, kids leaving them. You want them, you want the worst of the worst happen to them. So the fact that they would only get, you know, some barrage of hate online for a week and they might get dropped off a couple of shows, it can, you know, it maybe leaves a bit of a sour taste in the mouth. But that's what I thought counterculture was about. Then it turned into a thing of like, let me just get people cancelled because I just don't agree with their points of view which I never thought would be a real um, beneficial or constructive way to use that power or whatever, that kind of moment. It just didn't make any sense. Like this, just because you don't like what someone says or because they don't share your opinion, now you want to counsel them. It just seemed a little bit crazy and a real misuse of whatever that moment was in culture and society. And then, of course, it got its own, you know, it kind of gained a life of its own and it went in a completely different way. And by the end of it, people were kind of tired of it and it got really boring really fast but i also think the other part of social cancel culture that i didn't like was this thing where a lot of people were doing where they would email and kind of contact people like the not the knocking and the snitching i didn't like like if the story is out there already people are going out their way to contact brands and you know um partners that this person whoever this person is right is getting cancelled worked with in order to kind of get them cancelled 
I didn't like that pushing of the narrative was a bit too much for me in that regard. Like going out of your way to try and end somebody's quote unquote career. When the evidence is out there, the story is out there, let the natural course of sort of like, you know, life and the industry kind of take its course. And slowly but surely, they would obviously probably get their, um, their just desserts. But another part of me thinks the other side of counterculture that I didn't like was this weird thing that's kind of happening with the Nepo baby discussion. And now stay with me. It feels like with me, the Nepo baby discussion, the nepotism baby discussion, right? There was a clear, um, it felt like it was a, it was a chance just to highlight to people who are maybe struggling, who are on the kind of the outside looking in, who have been able to get into an industry such as entertainment that's very hard to get into and there's no real direct route in and it's all a bit just make it up, just fake it till you make it, you know, figure it out along the way kind of thing, work a crappy job here, assist there, intern here. There's all these weird ways to get there. It's not really straightforward, right? It's kind of complicated. And there's a lot of egos mixed in it and money and, you know, power imbalances and all this sort of madness. It's hard to get in. I always thought to me the nepotism baby debate was more so to give that person who's on the outside in who's struggling who's working a dead-end job and unable to make auditions and all this sort of stuff and they're looking at themselves thinking rah man i'm that 21 i haven't got any auditions and this person's like 19 and they're on a hit tv show somewhere it was important for that person to know that hey that person's 19 then a hit tv show not only you know because of this but part of the reason why they're there is because their dad is whoever some person at some network where the show's on or their mum is a screenwriter who knows the woman who wrote the screenwriter for the first episode and got her a flipping random whatever it may be but there was always a lack of understanding of like where why those people got where they got to now sometimes you know you could say hey you should be aware of those things if you don't know it you're a bit naive in the industry you're in but i think that was what the point of the nepotism baby um argument or discourse was about hey you know this is what's actually going on in the industry this should give you some solace that even though your journey is taking longer you eventually still will get there but this is why this person's there without much experience this person gets a deal off of just one a couple of pages of a script not even a fully fleshed out thing all these sort of things are what kind of going on and i feel like now the nepotism thing has turned into a weird sort of um way for the industry and maybe these broadsheets and these media organizations to remind people of just how powerful they are in deciding who our kings and queens are on tv and entertainment and i thought the same thing happened with counterculture um the organizations and the brands on this sort of stuff became really aware of how powerful they could be and it was a weird sort of reminder of what they could do to you so if the, if, if netflix say no if instagram says no all, sorts, all these platforms and networks and things that you use to kind of you know showcase your talent it was a kind of a way to of course professionally co you know counsel you but also to remind everybody else to sort of stay in line and then I guess the saving grace of that was that people had podcasts or people had their own content that they were doing on the side. So nowadays you can't ever really get cancelled unless you're somebody who primarily always relied on the institutions, right? You always relied on um, the corporations to kind of support your dreams or whatever it may be. Uh, but if you have your own stuff going on, it's very rare these days that you can get cancelled fully. Look what's happened to Chris Leo. Chris Lee has essentially been accused of running a sex cult, sometimes with underage girls, allegedly, and his fans are still sticking by him. Now, you can believe the allegations or not believe them, but the fact that he still has a career doing the thing that he loves in terms of stand-up and recording podcasts goes to show that counterculture doesn't exist because if you can, if you do have a fan base, you can sort of weather that sort of storm going forward. So I'm hoping, even though Lizzo didn't say this, I'm hoping in the future what we do see is more of a drive to really get the people who are doing you know bad things in society maybe illegal things maybe things that are generally will put people into in danger instead of focusing our time on trying to counsel people who maybe have an alternative lifestyle or maybe have views that go against the grain or something those are things that we should just point and laugh at like a documentary or like a reality tv show or stuff they should talk about over a beer with your friends but there shouldn't be things that should be on the ticker tape of a news program there shouldn't be things that should be debated in congress and stuff or house of commons there should be things that are just left to us lowly people to kind of debate about but there shouldn't be things that should you know result in you kind of losing everything because you think so and so isn't you know it's like me thinking now like 
there was this point in time in culture where if you came out and had something bad to say about Meghan Markle, you were basically, in a weird way, kind of accused of racism. Like, people look to you as if, okay, you don't like us because she's black, which, you know, is arguable. But you know what I mean? That's what people would look at you like. And if you didn't have compassion with Prince Harry. But now, because of all the press they've been doing, look how the conversation's shifted around them. It's not obviously full court press in terms of hating them, but the acceptance of people being willing to hear you know um the other side of the argument as to why they're not really too keen on Meghan mark or prince harry nowadays is allowed more in public discourse so these things can change so to counter somebody based on their opinion in a moment which feels a little bit crazy it feels a little bit contrarian it feels a little bit um edgelordy is a bit short-sighted because you never know in a couple of years that could end up being what everyone's thinking anyway and then you know that person lost a career and now everyone's kind of there rabbiting their flipping beliefs that they held a long time ago so i'm not really sure if that's what lizzo was getting at because i can't you know again she's kind of said it in work twitter yes queen speech but from what i was able to glean that was kind of what i felt like she was getting at so big up lizzo for standing up for that sort of thing because she clearly doesn't need to with her level of celebrity and the other thing i wanted to mention was this story regarding Lil Wayne turning pro for this skateboard company called Thank You. And it's been all over the place. I wanted to quickly just touch upon this because, you know, it kind of did tickle me a little bit, see some of the response out there. And I want to share some of my story about how difficult it was being in the skateboarding community industry, whatever it may be here in the UK growing up back in the day, being a boy from ends, black boy, an actual black boy. This week, it was just announced that Lil Wayne is now pro for Thank You Skateboards. How y'all doing? Spanish Mike released a video of Tori and Thank You Co surprising Lil Wayne with his pro board. The video was very wholesome and a nice celebration of Lil Wayne's connection to skateboarding, but it does beg the question, is he now a professional skateboarder? I think it's also worth noting that this was a surprise for Wayne and he wasn't involved in the decision. Surprise me by letting me know today. Before we express any opinions, I think we have to ask ourselves, what does it mean to be a professional skater. The definition of professional that. makes some money because of signature skate deck product. Now in 2023, it's pretty easy to get your own skateboards made. So pretty much anyone can start a company and turn anyone pro, right? Well, that is the fun gray area that we get to live in. Shane O'Neill shares his thoughts about this on his nine club when he's turning Uto pro. That was my concern when we started the company. It's like, I don't know how this is company's gonna go. Plus I'm turning him pro. I know I'm a pro skater and stuff, but I'm not like self-centered to the fact that I think my company's a real thing. You know, it's like mm. I'm turning someone pro. Right. I'm really. Is that it's illegal? a big deal? Is that illegal? <laughs> There's no union. I just right, started right. a company myself as a pro skater. Right. And made him pro. Like, is that? Cool or no, I don't know. But now let's explore some other celebrities. Johnny Knoxville's name is on a skateboard and he has only skated two times in his life. I'm gonna drop in on the vert ramp for the first time ever. What about Steve-O? He's been on and off skating for 30 years and he legitimately can do some hard tricks. But just because he releases his own board with his own company, is he a pro or is it just merchandise? Danny Duncan is also interesting. He's been a skateboarder his whole life and is pretty good. But is he pro? Is he a pro snowboarder too? I think there's this ambiguous bar set for the amount of skill that someone must have before we view them as a professional skateboarder and some expectations to be involved in the skate industry and skate community. What it seems like to me is if you ask Lil Wayne straight up if he thinks he's a pro skater, he's going to tell you of course he doesn't but he's hyped and honored to be recognized by the skateboarding world. Regardless of how you phrase it, I still think this is super sick and great for skating and I love to see Lil Wayne's energy and approach being so pure that he really does in fact love skating. I've experienced a lot of great feelings yeah okay i don't know if there's a feeling that come close to landing on them four wheels, four wheels bro. right yeah. yeah let me know in the comments is so yeah so big up little wayne for turning pro i'm all for it i really am i've been all for it ever since he started skateboarding with all this you know truck fit stuff he was doing even though he only had like four tricks under his belt that he could do and he was just repeating them again and again what you saw in his face when he was skating was somebody that clearly had found a passionate hobby outside of hip-hop outside of rapping outside of being involved in that whole scene that whole community that he's obviously committed his whole life to that gave him some level of joy that brought him some level of solace now this could be something to tie with the fact that he was maybe on you know 
doing whatever he was doing back then that maybe you know it was a welcome distraction but you did generally see that kind of amazement that wonder and that kind of just joy that skateboarding can bring to a lot of people and i thought you know similar to myself you know growing up in a really rough neighborhood that sort of sense of escapism of being able to jump on your deck and just be able to just roll out um you know and kind of clear your mind and go somewhere you know like a car park and just spend hours and hours trying to perfect your kick flips or trying to land a kick flip let alone you know a hill flip or something like that um, those things were really something that i kind of resonate to when i kind of first got into skateboarding and my routine to skateboarding was a bit weird a bit unconventional i think i started off skating when i was maybe like 15 or something or 14 and most of it was based upon this kind of this show that used to happen on tv back in the day i forgot the name of it but it was basically this show where they took these five kids on a bus around your uk and go up to skate and then they basically had to think at the end of it, you basically get to turn amateur or pro, I think, or something along those kind of lines. And you had to send a video of yourself skating to get involved. It was sick, man. It was like a kind of real, it was a like kind of, not real world, but it was sort of like a reality TV show where they had all these kids on a bus going around the UK living their lives. And for someone like myself, who was really young at that time and definitely wasn't allowed out that much and wasn't allowed out to go on a bus with other people, you know, traveling the world, it was sort of like a weird things to kind of witness kids my age doing like rah man they're out there having fun you know frolicking and doing the whole skateboarding lifestyle thing and i always loved that and then of course came the x games and then of course came stuff like um what else is oh obviously streetwear that was obviously another big thing that kind of got me to skateboarding but one of the things i remember realizing when i got into skateboarding i came with it i came into it really naive really kind of bushy-eyed and sort of just like hopeful oh my god it's an amazing thing i discovered and then I kind of realized all the little intricacies and politics and, you know, seeing things that will turn most people off. And I guess they, they're inbuilt there on purpose to essentially keep the people who aren't really about it out, which is good because there is a lot of kind of self-policing. Um, there is a lot of gatekeeping involved in skateboarding that, like I said, is a good thing because I don't think it's, it could survive this long and not be lame and not go out sad like how rollerblading and all these other things have gone out and maybe even bmxing because of how much um people care about it and they do their best especially at the core level and then i guess that kind of has reverse re 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 what's that word how do you say that word re reversions um especially at the core level and obviously that, that has effects that kind of are felt on the you know on the bigger scale when it comes to those sort of things but one thing that i didn't like and i've got to stress this i didn't like at all was this really pompous and sort of like snotty attitude a lot of skateboarding people had back in the day especially when i was coming up when i used to go to that old slam city skate store in new street covent garden if you know you know and a lot of those guys in there were really like up you know they'd really kind of point their nose in the sky at the thought of them ever kind of becoming pally pally or having any relationship to things like you know fashion or sneaker culture at the time there was even certain shops that would go out of their way i remember slam did have the thing sort of sort of thing which i felt was a little bit um degrading in a way where they'd have this thing where oh if you went to buy a pair of dunks the sbs they'd make you do a kickflip or like a competition thing either i think it was a discount oh no sorry not discount i think yeah i think it was a discount or maybe you got them free i don't know like if you can land a trick or something they'd give you a certain discount off a shoe which i always thought was really demeaning in that regard but then i also remember times when i was working for hypebeast back in the day doing some editing sort of some do some post contribution where you just basically write up the post that you see on there and you get paid like a flat rate i used to do that back in the day when you know hypebeast first started and i remember i was kind of putting together a story about like street style or something and i think i popped into slam one day to ask them oh if you want to be involved in this thing and the way i got laughed out of that store was hilarious like the way that they kind of like scoffed at the name they scoffed at what i was trying to do and everything and this was me also being part of that scene for a while like i've gone i got i went there to kind of watch various skate videos get get screened downstairs when that was open i went there to see certain people that were signing certain decks and whatnot teams that came through i was a part of that whole little you know um wider community that kind of surrounded sam csk so they were kind of familiar with me and who i was or oh, not familiar really but they were familiar with my face not who i was because i didn't speak anything um but when i went in there and they kind of scoffed and sort of like you know basically laughed me out of the building it was pretty disheartening don't get me wrong and also just a reminder of just how you know 
up their own ass these skateboarding skate guys can be and then you know other brands out there you know that kind of had a really i don't know how do you describe it like a kind of annoying cosplaying larping image of like working class culture and black culture and stuff and then you look at the core of the company it's just like full of well ads absolute well ads and these same well ads will kind of try and vibe you out they try and make it seem as if they're from where you're from they're not from ends at all whatever ends they're from they're not the same ends i'm that i'm from and they kind of act like they were and then there was a point in time where a lot of these guys especially the, the the core guys were very much against the whole fashion thing and then when a certain brand pops up and they start doing fashion editorials and flipping you know um adverts in vogue and stuff suddenly people start making excuses people are, are writing paragraphs of why it makes sense on like sidewalk skateboarding forum and all this sort of malarkey and making every excuse under the book and under the sun so and then i realized oh it is a kind of a pick and choose thing so if you're friends with somebody if you know somebody's all well and good but if it's somebody that kind of is you feel like is outside of your little scene is bad and because i kind of came from it from the outside you know naturally being more of a streetwear sneaker dude from ends and i came there it wasn't kind of the same thing that they wanted they'd want somebody else from i don't know um flipping croydon or something right or loughborough you know or the watford walls area that was kind of black as well but you know you know on the border and they were involved that would make more sense but then when i came in it was an issue so those same guys that were having an issue with those sort of things but then excuse all the flipping you know the carly crosses pretending she's jumping on a fucking skateboard all that sort of shit because it was of a particular brand you can go and spin on my finger let little wayne be pro if he's pro and thank you want to make him pro it's all well and good in my books because if you can allow gucci collabs and you can allow all this other doco nonsense bullshit then obviously you can allow Will Little Wayne to be a, a, a pro skateboard, especially when the parameters around being pro are so loose and ambiguous. Even I didn't know it, that's how loose and ambiguous it was. I just always assumed it was something that only happens when if you're with a legacy brand or something. I never actually knew that you could become pro with a newer brand, which kind of does throw up the idea of like how is it. I think it's I think pro is probably similar to like um, belts in like jujitsu because people would say oh a black belt from a certain um from a certain school it doesn't maybe hold as weight as a black belt from another school because of how hard the instructions are in terms of pushing you until you're able to get those belts and there's some people who have like lower belts or hard, but you know you know what i mean so maybe that's the same thing when that goes to skateboarding um it depends on what you know on what sort of tutelage you're under what team you roll with and all that sort of malarkey but regardless um, if they want to turn in pro I'm all for it the other thing as well Lil Wayne people really underestimate just how big of a celebrity he is how big of an icon he is we have no idea the amount of people and eyes and attention he's brought to skateboarding and if skateboarding overall is going to survive what you're going to need is for regular schmecking the normie types to kind of discover especially adults in their like late 30s 40s 50s you know suddenly falling back in love with skateboarding because for me when I look back at it, the reason why I didn't, I stopped sort of skateboarding was mainly about all that political stuff on the outside. Less so about, you know, the, 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 the acts or the quote unquote sport of it itself, right? Um, it was more so the other things outside of it that kind of, kind of, you know, uh, soured the taste in my mouth. But once you get away from that stuff and just focus on skateboarding, it's still an amazing thing to do. It's still an amazing skill to learn. It's still an amazing hobby to pursue in any way, shape or form. So imagine the amount of people who are going to be inspired by Lil Wayne's journey and be like you know what now that I'm away from the scene now that I'm not so closely tied to it I can just enjoy it for the fun um thing that it is and that's definitely what Lil Wayne's done so big up Lil Wayne he is pro in my book as long as um you know he's still alive he's pro in my book going forward a quick way to touch upon this I mentioned on the other podcast that 1883 is better than Yellowstone and I've now come to the conclusion 1923 is also better than Yellowstone and I think 1923 might be better than 1883 <laughs> amazing honestly I've never seen a prequel show or prequels be better than the flipping main show it's absolutely crazy the reason maybe this happened as well maybe there's a thing of like because they made Yellowstone maybe because they've seen the errors of what they did with that show or the little you know the little gaps the little things that they could have changed they've now gone back retroactively um I basically done the you know made them right in the new show or in these old show that kind of you know set the uh, precinct for what's kind of going forward in kind of yellowstone but 1923 is amazing to watch um number one more so because of their depiction of africa 
I think there is a guy in the family, I think it's Spencer Dutton. He's, um, you know, he's basically somebody that you, you would assume is suffering from some level of PTSD from the army. And he's basically ran away to Africa to pursue a career as, um, what would you call it? He's basically a hunter in a way, but he's also kind of a, uh, um, a hunter and a, what what they call them? Like a park guy, like a park ranger type of dude. Um, and maybe a conservationist as well. But essentially, he kind of goes there and he kind of, in, you know, in, um, connects himself with the local populace over there. He also kind of becomes friends with local tribesmen and people that help him out with things. And he's obviously kind of basically trying to escape his demons there. But I like that they've made Africa out to be his sort of like safe place his place where he can basically explore and dig deep into his psyche and kind of address his quote-unquote demons and i feel like that's a pretty nice and noble valiant effort that they've made um in terms of painting africa out to be this amazing wondrous mysterious sort of like garden of eden place where maybe all humanity started from and it's not done in a very heavy-handed way it's done very subtly and again this is a very whitewashed show so you don't even see that many black people on it. So that's the thing I like about it, that they kept it cult, they kept it historically accurate. They didn't try and, you know, uh, you know, sprinkle in flipping Jamie Foxx everywhere, make it seem like that was what's happening back then. Because Jamie Foxx wasn't Jamie Foxx back then. I mean, he was out there flipping, you know, scrubbing pots and plans or probably, what, pots and pans, sorry, or probably six feet under back then. So they've done it without it being super heavy handed. And I really do appreciate that. But overall, I feel like the story, the pacing is so good. Every episode of 1923. Now, maybe because 1923 overall, when they did put it together as a prequel, maybe they always had the vision that it's not going to go too far because I think they've done really well also because I think they could continue the story so long as they want. But I think they've kind of made them to probably be like shows that might only need, you know, one to four seasons, if that. But you can tell a large chunk of the story in like, you know one season with 10 episodes and each episode feels like a movie in itself so you get a real good chunk of character development and um, the plot kind of quickens and moves forward you can't wait until the next episode like now i think i'm episode four of 1923 and it's absolutely banging the acting is really good um the writing's amazing the development the story is really awesome i love everything about it so i really recommend that you check it out if you haven't i really really recommend check it out if you haven't now one show one show that i didn't like that i absolutely hated i'm getting up on the screen um no what is it? it's not called the rig that's a magazine back there what's it called uh rig no is it called the rig the rig the rig i think amazon right that's the one so there's this show, not the rig out. Big up the rig out. That was an old, I think, a bunch of it's still out. Was it like, an, was it like a football culture kind of fancy magazine? I forgot. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Big up those guys. But there's a show called The Rig that's out on Amazon Prime right now. And I always get duped by these things because I just got a thing for thrillers and, you know, whatever it may be. And it looked on the face of it to be quite interesting because I remember there was a time when I went to LA a real long time ago and I was on the plane and... I happened to get talking to people on my row. For whatever reason, I don't know why we were all sitting in a row in Virgin Airways and we all got talking, which rarely happens on flights. Usually on flights, you might have a brief word with somebody sitting next to you because you, know, you need to get up to get your bag and they might share a joke or two. But for whatever reason, all three of us sitting in our row end up chatting away for most of the flight. And it was quite nice. And one of the dudes that was sitting to my right, I think, or to my left, he was uh, working on an oil rig. And that's the first time I really had any sort of insight behind it. And, you know, I learned a lot about, like, you know, how horrible it can be, how fun it could be sometimes, depending on what crew you're with, the amount of money they can make, which is a lot in a very short period of time. But, you know, no communication with um basically back home you have to miss your family for long periods of time the hours are a bit crazy and you know the education that goes behind it blah 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 so really cool interesting stuff behind it but i remember him also talking a lot about the interpersonal politics that happened on rigs i think it's concerning like you know um the the kind of corporations that own them where they're situated at uh, the countries you have to visit the waters that they're in there's all this geopolitics many things going on there environmental stuff so it's really interesting so when i saw the show i was like oh this would be sick because it would be maybe an opportunity to kind of glean a little bit more into again i know it's a fictional sort of stuff but it would still be nice to sort of kind of see how they present 
um, the oil rigs and the culture behind them and the role they play in society and whatever it may be. And there was an opportunity, I felt like, to tell a very interesting story. Very, especially nowadays, given what we know about climate change. And for whatever reason, this show, The Rig on Amazon, failed on every single department. It's legitimately one of the worst things I've ever watched in my entire life. And I felt annoyed that I wasted however long it was to get through all the flipping first episodes. Uh, the first season, sorry. Tragic. And by the end of it, you don't really know anything more than what you knew from the beginning. There's no real idea on what anything is, what the threat they're facing is. Is it an alien? Is it life? Is it uh, is it a flip? What is it? Um... Is it a virus? You'd have no idea. It's just so ambiguous, so vague for the sake of it. It tries to be clever, but just comes across as dumb. The characters don't make any sense. Oh, the characters on this are awful. The actors, the actors are good. The characters are awful. For whatever reason, all the characters on this show are super disobedient. And from what I'm understanding of an oil rig, a lot of cooperation is needed to make that thing work. You can't just have people just deciding what they want to do on the whim because a lot of that things are going to a lot of your actions could you know negatively affect other people so you kind of have to you know uh, go by the book you kind of have to follow procedure throw to follow protocol just to ensure everybody's overall safety not to be a job's worth but for some reason in this thing everybody's some sort of flipping crusader everyone's out to seek the truth out to stand up for this out to do this is like dude sit your ass down bruv you're gonna get someone killed and of course naturally people do get killed and it seems that the reaction to people getting killed is really weird it's like oh you know they got killed because of my actions oh well what can you do it's like <laughs> why isn't there a revolt why isn't that person being hung up or being you know hung drawn and quartered themselves like why are they just alive also and the people that stay alive on this thing oh my god more people need to die people die on the show but more people should die then they already do die. Um, yeah, the, everything's, the only thing that's good about it is maybe some of the actors. Now, maybe even the actors actually, it's wasted on them. The, the writing is so bad, it makes the actors that are generally good sound horrible. Um, the pacing is terrible. It doesn't go anywhere, anywhere soon. I think from episode three onwards, I was skimming large parts of the flipping dialogue because it didn't matter. Nothing was actually happening. Just to kind of get to the flipping chunk of the story and still it was flipping missing and, you know, just crappy and just without any sort of sus substance it was horrible 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 to the point where i legitimately was furious with myself for committing to finishing it but i already crossed the flipping four episode threshold and i just had to go to the end and by the time i got to the end i was like what a waste of time what a waste of time so if you do have some time when you're on your schedule to watch something i recommend you don't watch the rig it's absolutely terrible and i'll be surprised if it gets a season two legitimately one of the biggest waste of times i've ever seen it's such a missed opportunity to, to actually tell an interesting story I'm sure it's an interesting story that you could tell, but they completely missed the mark by, I don't know, whatever else bullshit they were doing. Complete crap. Get out of here. I don't care about it. And I'm absolutely furious. I might have to mention it, but I just had to because, oh my God, what an absolutely terrible, horrendous show. What a waste of time. I can't, I can't believe I wasted any time flipping checking that stuff out. I honestly cannot believe it. Uh, let me just double check. So I want to check. So another thing I want to quickly mention here was this story which i'm actually surprised about this is courtesy of annie mac and she tweeted the following i'll get up on the screen actually she tweeted the following this is my oldest usb it was stolen after my before midnight gig in london now it's in my manager's office i was so relieved that it wasn't um some calculated malevolent act it was a drunken mistake and by god haven't we all done these or done those whoever you are thank you for sending it back and it's got a note there really sorry for the stress to cause we haven't accessed it it was a moment of drunken madness so sorry so if you remember i think i mentioned in another podcast that annie mac was playing somewhere i think it might be one of her daytime uh boomer raves and um i guess she was playing and maybe hadn't paid attention as somebody jumped over maybe the flipping dj booth and took one of her usbs and um she was on line crying about it oh i want my usb back please it's music over free laptops and computers that's not been backed up it's precious all this sort of nonsense and clearly the usb that contained maybe you know the evidence that you know of why we ended up invading iraq has kind of fun suddenly gone back to our hands so clearly a good thing my only one issue with it was number one if you're a professional DJ, 
surely at this level you should be routinely if not um you know as often as you can backing up all your usbs or making sure your usbs or your music collection is maybe on one place and maybe having different copies of it or something having it spread across three different places three different computers sounds a bit strange to me having such you know having your whole life depend on having your whole life depend on you know what usb will you return to is also a bit strange in my eyes but again what do i know and also then go into the internet and social media and begging them to kind of find it for you is also a bit strange and i think maybe it's because i'm just so like against asking for help and i generally just think you know if i ever lose anything that is my fault and generally it's always been my fault whether it's been to me just kind of not paying attention maybe me being reckless uh me just you know whatever not doing something right that kind of led to whatever i had going missing or somebody taking the opportunity to steal it lesson learned i'm not going to do that again i've done it plenty of times i used to lose my keys all the time and now i haven't lost my keys in many 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 years so clearly that has worked in some regard but i feel like this kind of um carrying of people's favor and sympathy and good nature to return stuff to is just weird it kind of reminds me of this article i saw recently of some dj guy or producer oh my whole studio got you know broken into and they stole all my equipment and now i can't make music can you guys go fund me so i can make music again it's like what i know it's a distressing thing to get all your equipment stolen but then to try and set up a go find me people to what to give you money to buy all your stuff again is bizarre you know it's a, it's a l it's a it's a it's a blotch on your record it's not going to make you feel good but you might have to just go back out there and work for your money and then kind of work your way up to buying your equipment again or you know whatever getting a loan or something but going to your audience and asking them for money is just strange in this case i guess it's a bit more understanding understandable maybe her you know panic about it because like i said she does those boomer raves so you're, you're assuming everyone that's there is kind of there with you know with good intentions they're kind of there because they support you there's not probably a lot of like randoms popping by because of the times that they're on and um, they're usually people that primarily want to go out to those sort of events so it might be a bit of a you know it might kind of hit different when stuff like this happens at those sort of events but i also you know I'm understanding enough to know that anything that revolves around dance music or dance culture or nightlife in any way, shape or form, whether it's in the morning or in the afternoon, is always going to affect, is always going to attract a certain, you know, character of a person. And that's always going to kind of lead to maybe some level of trouble. So keeping your head on a swivel is probably important. But when it comes to um, drunken moments, drunken, embarrassing stories, I thought this would be a good opportunity to share one because the one if you I can think of, because I haven't had an occasion where I've had the urge to jump over somebody's turntables to go and grab their USB. Because again, I'm thinking, was this even plugged in? Was this something that was on the side of the flipping CD that was playing? I don't really know. But whatever the case may be, I think the last time I can remember me having an embarrassing moment behind or in a club, you know, around the booth, might have been a long time ago when I went to like a Love Fever party. I don't know who was playing, but somebody was playing live. And for whatever reason, I thought it would be funny. Or I thought, no, funny. I thought it would be cool at the time because, you know, when someone's playing a good set and they sort of like take down the bass and they put it back up again. I thought that would be funny because I absolutely blasted out of my mind. I think I must have had like, you know, three and a half grams of flipping MD to my face on my own with countless amounts of alcohol. And I guess I was pulling up and down the flipping levels. And the first time people kind of felt it. And, you know, when you're drunk and you're high, you feel like you're the main character of the story. You feel like fucking... Um, yeah, you got main character energy, right? You feel like everything you're doing is funny. Everything you're saying is hilarious. Um, every, like, all your actions you're doing, your center of attention. Everyone can't, you know, everyone just wants to be around you. And reality is you're a drunk and messes getting everyone's nerves. And I did it a second time and a third time. And then I said, yeah, they say, hey, get the fuck out of the fucking DJ room. And I remember that being really embarrassing. The day after kind of, you know, apologize. and be like, oh my God, I can't believe I did that. But I can't ever think of a time where I'd be like in the booth nicking something. I mean, it's the last thing I'm thinking in my mind is to take someone's possessions. But again, there are people out there who, you know, don't have the best um, nature out there. So clearly you have to keep your head in a swivel when it comes to sort of things. But I don't know. Personally, I just find it, I don't know. I find it a bit weird. I feel like if something like that gets nicked from you, 
that's you not paying attention. What are you doing? Spending too much time hugging people behind the booth, you know, distracted, rolling up a cigarette, whatever you were doing. Maybe keep your eyes, you know, on the prize. Maybe treat your your profession that you've been granted so graciously by the public with some respect and just focus on your flipping gig for the time. There's so many things that do that, innit? That get, they're on their phones and stuff. But some things yourself, you guys, that get, you literally got the dream job. I've seen these videos of people out here, you know, clanging behind the decks, too drunk and smashed and not taking stuff. Like, you got the dream job. You're employed to work like, what, anywhere between an hour to six hour, eight hour shifts, right? In terms of your, you know, um, behind the booth. But for the most part, you're, you know, it's a pretty easy job. Just commit to just focusing and playing the music behind the DJ booth for that a lot of time. Anything else that happens after the fact happens after the fact. But this idea that a lot of these people have that they need to be doing going on their phone, drinking, doing lines, or doing whatever, it's just crazy. I feel like behind the booth, like focus on the job at hand, please. And you know, provide the best show possible for your fans. But you know, whatever. Um, it works out for Annie Mac. Happy for her. Well done. You got your USB back. Hopefully now she keeps them close to her persons and doesn't turn around in the middle of a set and maybe they won't get taken away again. And obviously the guy himself, you know, you need to relax as well. If you're taking bath sauces, mm -hmm. making you jump over a DJ room to take someone's USB, it's a bit crazy. But hey, what do I know? What do I know? Going on with that, I got this story courtesy of The Guardian that I thought was pretty cool. It says, six-day legal rave sees 5,000 people descend on a Spanish village. Residents watch in amazement as tent caravans and seven stages were set up in the village center. Now, I'm pretty sure there are some people I follow on Instagram who kind of were there because I can, I don't know, the scene looks a bit familiar to me. But let's continue with the story. It says the music blared for days, thumping through dozens of speakers hastily erected up in the dusty fields against the backdrop of Spain's Sierra, Sierra Nevada mountains. Um, thousands of revelers danced while others pursued um, stand selling homemade soap, piercings, the size of pieces. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I saw somebody there. Yeah. I'm pretty sure I saw someone there. So let's play a bit of the clip here. This is from, where is this from? This is from RTV. <laughs> La fiesta acabará hasta que el cuerpo aguante, es lo que relatan algunos de los más de mil jóvenes que llevan de fiesta desde el viernes. Cuando diga la gente del coche. Vienen de todas partes de España. Yo soy de Mallorca. Desde Cádiz. Soy de Valencia. Y de Europa. Albania. Just bear white people, by the way. There's not one person that said they're from Angola, but... <laughs> En terreno municipal, a dos kilómetros en línea recta del pueblo granadino de La Peza, han montado este macroevento que incluye puestos de comida, tienda de ropa y hasta cinco escenarios con música electrónica. Está colapsado todo, hay miles de coches en los arcenes. La Guardia Civil no les desaloja por motivos de seguridad. Cerca de medio centenar de agentes controlan que no lleguen más vehículos, pero no prohíben la llegada a pie de nuevos asistentes. A pesar de la decena de multas por tráfico, tenencia de drogas o acampada ilegal que se han interpuesto, nada impide que la música de esta macrofiesta ilegal siga sonando más de 70 horas después. Anyway, continue the story. It says the legal rave began on Friday, choking um, of traffic and leaving pulsating beasts wafting throughout the nearby village. It was 24 hours a day of chin chin boom, says Fernando Alvarez, the mayor of the motors. <laughs> <laughs> chin chin boom i love that residents watching the amazement as a maze of tents caravans and seven stages um, sp spouted up less than a mile away from the village center and estimated five thousand people many of them spaniards but also hailing from italy and the netherlands descend on the site we are 1200 people here imagine we woke up on friday morning and we were 5200 people here by saturday we were six thousand. truthfully it was a bit chaotic after six days of festivities, of festivities party goes began dismantling the tent stages on Wednesday morning. It was a release of the mayor, and I'm super happy. Municipal officials, however, remained stumped as how the international event had managed to materialize on municipal lands without any warnings. We have no idea. Despite lacking a kind of permit or the license, the kinds of long days events have gone on. That is for a few hitches. Frankly, it was magnificently organized at various. It was like a small town. They had a bakery, a pizzeria, clothing shops, people who would braid your hair, absolutely everything. I'm amazed that they managed to set this all up in the span of a few hours. 
as a party got underway on Friday, the, most, the municipality, sorry, was quick to lodge a complaint with the police. The police arrived swiftly, decided that it would be safer to keep watch over the fiesta rather than forcefully evict the thousands of revelers. Barricades were set up to block new vehicles from the site, while a helicopter kept an eye on the revelers made their way to the site by foot. The days of partying had been largely peaceful with just a handful of arrests for drugs or resisting authority, police said. Amid assurances that the party was set to end on Tuesday, the municipality kept watch on the sign of the party was dying down Despair, despair, sorry, despairing as the volume was cranked up after the hours that the party was meant to end and the distance throbbing of the music sparked curiosity among some of the residents with young people and an eight-year-old villager opted to join the party one residents welcomed the party goers and sources of spanish media who turned up the village injecting a bit of cash into the local economy they said we got six days of entertainment out of it uh, but we also recognize the incident has given us a bit of publicity and put us on the map and we're here for anyone who wants to visit but maybe not five thousand people all at once but the one thing that i want to make sure to kind of emphasize here this party went out without a hitch largely no arrest from what i've been able to read they cleaned up the entire space that they were using like came in there like absolute ninjas so this is what raves can do out there in the open right if people actually leave people alone and give them the space to kind of enjoy themselves treat them like actual adults people can actually gather in on mass have a good time and just go home as they did and obviously inject some cash into a local flipping community but another thing that i also want to point out is that this never reminded to me of just how different people do outside living because a lot of it as well you have to imagine it's in spain it's not here in the uk you know spaniards in general um having known some of my life are just generally they're just more you know attuned and adept at kind of doing outside fun stuff they just know how to do it more maybe because you come from a sunnier climate so you have to stay outdoors more often or whatnot but they just know how to kind of navigate outside better they know where to hang where to chill i'm sure most of you guys if you know spanish people or you know italian people or french people the same thing they just have a real good way of navigating around these sort of things so it's never too much never too little it's always done in a sort of kind of the right way because i feel like in the uk for whatever reason maybe because we have bad actors but we generally have people there's always a couple of them in groups who just let the moment get to them and they kind of get lost in the source um, they don't really have any self-control and if anything they end up ruining the front for everybody because all it takes is a couple of people from each group so each group if you have if, if each group in the uk has at least one to two liabilities all it takes is a group it's a room full of friends to have a room full of liabilities and suddenly your pie will descend into chaos and then suddenly you know next day you you're hearing about a club that you went to license has been revoked and you have no opportunity to kind of go back to that sort of space so a lot of it has to do maybe like a cultural thing where these guys just get it they understand how to navigate you know spaces how to navigate fields how to navigate clubs how to you know participate and have fun together and not make it go too crazy because i feel like this could never and i repeat never happen in the uk about a hitch something awful would have happened and also like the fact that the police did what they did they came down therefore hey there's too many people here to try and disperse them all at once we might just keep them keep you know keep away and obviously what they did they probably set up a cordon like they said no no new people are allowed in but we're gonna just like keep them you know keep watch on them make sure everything's going all right and then when they end on tuesday we were to kind of escort them off the fields and make sure no one's kind of coming back but they dealt with it perfectly and i absolutely love that and that's something that's definitely giving me a little kind of smile kind of reading that story of just how amazing it went and how kind of well received it was by most of the locals because they kind of brought something extra to that kind of small community so yeah big up everybody that descended in that party and had a good time it looked complete fun it looked like complete fun to me Moving on with this, I want to touch upon this, which I thought was interesting. This is courtesy of DJ Mag, and it's unfortunate news regarding Spiritland, um, this club here or listening bar, I would assume you'd call it, in South Bank that's unfortunately not able to close. And the reasons behind that are pretty interesting. So it says here. Spiritland has announced the closure of its venue at the Royal Festival Hall in South Bank, London. Breaking news via social media, the venue's team cited COVID-19, Brexit, energy prices and many other factors as reasons for the closure. It says, we had loved to continue our mission there, but the, sorry, 
We'd love to continue our mission there, but the current conditions simply don't allow it. A social media statement from the team read. Spiritland Royal Festival Hall has been the only independent venue in a sea of chains. The only space offering a culturally aligned program to Southbank's arts venues and a place for Londoners and out-towners alike to eat, drink and enjoy music in a beautiful setting. Huge thanks to all of you who have been part of it. Diners, drinkers, dancers and DJs and all our collaborators and all our team who worked with us there. The venue which opened in December 2018 included a 180 cover restaurant as well as providing a space for guest performances and DJ sets alongside talks by BBC Radio Force, BBC Radio Fire Host. BBC Radio 4 host John Wilson. The cost of living crisis currently putting a strain on all venues across the UK. Last year, Spaces Spaces 289 and Bristol Record Store Idle Hands announced closure due to increasing cost of rent. Other venues operated by Spiritland, such as Spiritland's Headphone Bar in Mayfair, Cocktail Bar in King's Cross and um, Spiritland Productions will remain open. Um, it says here the Black Keys event at the Spirit Land Festival Hall will still be taking place tomorrow on the 7th of January. A final closing event will take place on the 13th of January. And this is the final event, right? There's the last dance they've got here. I think I've got on RA that's currently sold out. That features fucking Jarvis Cock and Alessix Taylor, which might tell you the reason why they're basically closing down, right? If you've got a, you know, an amazing listening bar and you're having fucking Jarvis Cock and Alessix Taylor. Jarvis Cock, I love him. He's had some great songs back in the day, but come on man and alexis taylor his band hasn't been relevant for like you know close to a decade but hey what do i know so i'm surprised by this right mostly because i don't really understand why this especially in south bank and given how it looks on the inside because i've never been i might actually go this friday but i'm very surprised that listening bars haven't taken off as well as they should have in the uk because there's definitely it feels like a Ex willingness by local councils to approve um, licenses for like restaurants and bars in general, as opposed to clubs. Most councils tend to like those more so than nightclubs. So if that's the case, I feel like a listening bar is the perfect kind of fusion of a restaurant and a nightclub, really, because it gives you the ability to have DJs play there, it gives you the ability to invest a lot into the audio, you know, experience of a club. And it also gives you opportunity to really have fun with the menu and maybe with the residencies and people who are kind of, you know, um, hosting or managing the kitchen for any short space of time. But for whatever reason, it just hasn't kicked off the way it maybe I thought it would. And I'm not really too sure why. Maybe because culturally, when people go out, they just want to either go out or not go out. So maybe that kind of halfway in the middle thing is not really a vibe. Maybe because the lineups aren't that interesting at these things. Because imagine if you're a DJ, where would you rather play? Would you rather play in a restaurant, calm bar, or would you rather, rather go play in an absolute legit nightclub somewhere? So I guess nightclub, and maybe as well, if the restaurant, calm bar doesn't play that well, and maybe pays you in meals or something, you'd probably go where everyone's going to pay you in cash. I'm not really too sure, but that's something that's always kind of really confused me, why listening bars never really took off the way they probably should have here in the UK, um, considering how we are culturally, how we are societally, how local government, how local councils respond to issues around bars and whatnot you would have thought a listening bar would be the perfect perfect antidote and the perfect way to kind of appease those people but for every reason the public just hasn't responded well to them and again there's been many iterations of them i feel like but for every reason they haven't really captured people's imagination i'm not really too sure what the reason is but you know um, rp spirit land and south bank hopefully they're able to kind of get a place somewhere else that they can kind of you know get posted up Maybe this new, maybe this end party that they're doing um, that's coming up, where is it? I think it's this one here, right? Maybe that'll be an opportunity for people like myself to go and check it out because, again, I never really had the inkling to go myself. That might also explain why they never really had a chance because if heads like myself don't go, then you don't have normies going. It's basically a wrap for you or maybe just a promotion, I'm not really too sure. But regardless, they've got a um, last dance party happening on Friday, the 5th of January. So if you're around in London and um, you want to check it out, definitely do spirit land royal festival hall last party featuring alexis taylor and jarvis cocker details are obviously there on the screen if you want to check it out details are on the screen oh and then i went to do a little, quick little follow-up actually on these balenciaga steroid boots that i was completely and still am infatuated and obsessed by when obviously i saw them debuted on the runway at the balenciaga show but then mainly when i saw kanye wear them irl in this iconic street pit 
street style picture that went semi-viral on my side of the internet and as you can see from this picture he's wearing that um if i'm pretty sure it's a balenciaga bomber jacket also that he absolutely beat into the ground which i love that was a good little area of kanye wearing the same outfits every single day i think he's still doing it now i'm not too sure but essentially him wearing a black bomber jacket with some black jeans and these really crazy oversized exaggerated almost cartoon-esque boots that look a bit similar to some of the stuff that he's been wearing in terms of those sort of like firefighter boot type things that i've even been flipping you know um uh, drawn to kind of buying my own versions of them which i haven't really worn too tough here and there because they are really really big i've got a pair of i think they're like js fire fire boots and they're huge you really start to really imagine how this guy's traversing around town wearing these every single day and i think for the regular regular folk out there like myself it probably isn't the greatest thing to wear but i love the boots primarily i've always loved them balenciaga boots because i think in general Demna and maybe whoever he works with in terms of footwear from his times at Vetma I feel like has always done a really good army style boot um, maybe it's because of his kind of you know where he's from in terms of Central Europe in terms of Georgia with the wars and whatnot going on there whether it's because of maybe growing up and going to places like Berlin or maybe been shopping around Paris I'm not really too sure but he has a real good understanding of what makes a really good army boot and I specifically mean like that kind of um trooper type lace up that doesn't look too crazy doesn't have too many bells and whistles but just has the right shape the right amount of thickness in the sole the square is not overly pointed and pretty square the, the height of them is always really great because you take these steroid boots and you shrink them down these steroid boots you shrink them down to like a regular size shoe and they're not this inflamed cartoon like um you know behemoth they'll still look pretty sick that's why i think it makes for a really good boot so i saw them initially i was kind of all over them and clearly i'm not the only one because if you go into the balenciaga web store they've absolutely sold out i'm here now on the site i've got it up on my screen and it says they're available for £999, which is something that I didn't know. I didn't think that would be that much. Cause I think the Crocs um, kind of waterproof boot things that they did were, if I'm not mistaken, around 600 or 700 So I assumed they'd be around the same price. But for whatever reason, maybe because Balenciaga are making this in-house, because maybe this, that's kind of what they did with the with the Triple S's. They made the Triple S's. I think initially I had a pair of Triple S's the first ones that came out that were made in italy even though they kind of ended up dying away but they were made in italy and those made in italy ones were a bit more expensive than the ones that they eventually started making out of china when they obviously started becoming a bit more popular they need to pump out um as many quantities as possible and styles and whatnot so maybe this is the case with the steroid boot maybe over time once they get the production down pat or once the demand becomes really crazy then maybe they might switch production and it might get a bit cheaper i'm not too sure but for now then 995 pounds the steroid boot from the description here it says uh, it's a black full eva and if you're familiar with sneakers you'll know most of your midsoles are made out of eva this is in several looks of the supreme sorry balenciaga my bad um spring 2023 collection actually talking about that what everything be going on with demna is that supreme collaboration on holding or has that been cancelled hmm let's see but anyway continue so there it is and you can see if you go down the a list of the sizes it's all notified me so clearly they're all completely sold out um, i think last time i checked it said out of stock probably to change the verbiage to say notify me which is a good little way to get people to kind of sign up but essentially what they are is that they look like um they look like a boot that's kind of a regular boot that's basically been inflamed but if you look closer they're essentially just like a rubber um wellington in a shape that kind of make to look like a really big army boot and i think all of it all of it is basically kind of one piece if i'm not mistaken if, if, maybe i'm mistaken this is here in a description boot round toe 20 millimeter arch exaggerated volume lightweight material blends like a logo and tongue 12 eyelets molded show and upper made in italy wipe with soft cloth so to me they look absolutely incredible i'm a really big fan of them and i thought they look really cool and really neat but clearly as you can see here oh is that a bit of lining in there okay maybe i'm mistaken no i think it's full eva i think it's full eva if you can see there i think it's full eva but the lining makes it look like they've got some lining in them but yeah they look incredible to me there but unfortunately with these boots it seems like in real life they don't actually look the greatest on most people or they might end up people might end up struggling styling them in real life 
that would be the main issue. And I feel like a lot of the looks here, I've got a couple here, I've kind of gone for the all black type of look with the boots and kind of sticking some sweatpants in them. The next look on the next slide has a guy wearing, I'm pretty sure, skinnier jeans in terms of following what Kanye did on his pair. And then I think there's a picture here also that features um, K. Trinada's wearing them, but he's sitting down, so it's kind of hard to kind of judge how that looks on him. But even his stuffing, I don't really like. He's kind of stuffed those into his shoes too tough for me personally. But these are going to be very interesting to see how people make them work in real life. Because I guess because of the shaft, right? Is that what it's called? The shaft, um, the top bit of the shoe and the opening where you put your, your, your foot in, it's quite wide. Most people's pants probably won't fit the outside of that unless you wear you know super big korean brand you know pants and stuff um people are going to find it really hard to have shoe trousers that go over them so you're going to have to wear trousers that sort of like you stick into the boot but i guess in this respect what would you rather stick them in so they're like how kitchen others wearing them where they kind of look like they've been stuffed in there or kind of have this relaxed kind of sitting on top of it look that kanye's got going on here which i think maybe is more so sort of a consequence of him just walking as opposed to um it kind of being a style thing maybe i'm not too sure but as you can see even there the stereo boot see it sort of just looks like an exaggerated version of this sergeant boot that they had before so i think it's again i feel like they make really they're really under they're going to get a hype that they deserve or the adulation they deserve to kind of um making really good army boots in black but it looks like in real life they haven't necessarily been able to hit the same way that they did online with people and i'm curious to see as more people end up getting a pair if we end up seeing a few more questionable fits because i think we all i think we end up seeing a lot more people who end up i think it'd be like the triple s's remember when the triple s's were on the runway they looked incredible and then you suddenly start, saw people wearing them on real life and they end up looking super super crap so maybe this might end up happening with these stereo boots but regardless of how what they do i don't care because i'm going to end up getting a pair myself i feel like these are absolutely incredible and clearly they probably won't be worn as many times as i think they're going to be worn but if i had to choose between these or the crocs I definitely go for these. I prefer having a kind of exaggerated crazy boot thing than having that weird croc, you know, fire high thing going on. I feel like those are a bit lame, but I'll definitely end up getting these. I feel like going for because even with these, you could these, if easily remove the laces and just wear them as is, and they still look pretty hard because I don't think that tongue flaps down personally. Maybe I'm getting crazy here, but I think that tongue is kind of a bit of a place, not also a placeholder, but it's not exactly a thing what was what it doing what was it? Yeah, go off. get off here yeah so i think that tongue isn't actually a tongue i think it's just like molded in a way to make it look like it's a tongue that you can kind of move around but i don't think that's the case i think it's just like a you know not a placeholder but it's just like a thing that sort of because i think the mold goes around it all in here maybe a little bit slit here but i don't think it moves around too tough i don't think your foot's gonna jiggle around so you can definitely get away with just you know removing the laces and just having it rock like that but I do like them. I do like them. They look really cool. I'm big fan. Obviously, you've got the Balenciaga branding here on the bottom. Made in Italy. There's no stamp of the size underneath the shoe, which is a shame. I always like that. They have a little 44, 45 at the bottom there. But that's pretty cool still regardless. And also, you got the added advantage if you're walk, walking somewhere, um, you know, in the cold. Especially if there's snow or there's mud, wherever you can leave these little Balenciaga imprints on the, on the ground you're walking, which is pretty tough. And I'm a big fan of that either. But this look and this look book is pretty cool, right? This model I know is wearing them, but I like this look that he's got with this, you know, with the Balenciaga Adidas collaboration jacket, the jeans, and uh, what's going to the jeans stuffed into the top of the Balenciaga boots there. But I like them. I like the look at them. Definitely going to end up getting a pair when I do get around to getting them and, you know, making them work. But again, from what I've seen so far on the interwebs, people are struggling super hard to make them work. And um, yeah, I think they're going to throw up a lot of interesting styling challenges for some people out there. So let's see how they roll. Let's see how they roll. Anyway, that's been the Exxon Zing Show, episode number 638. Thanks so much for tuning in. It's been a pleasure to have your company. If you're first time tuning in to the show, you know what to do. Smash like, hit subscribe, leave a comment down below. If you listen to the audio podcast of the show, you will definitely hear my tune today. So if you haven't already registered and subscribed to the audio version of the show, make sure you do. That's why I always post my tune today at the end, and I always think it bangs and it slaps. So make sure you check that out. Um, I was just trying to get to 50,000 so 50, subscribers on this channel. So if you want to do that, make sure you click subscribe and join me and help the guy out. And until then, I'll see you guys soon. Take care. Peace.